Three visitors come to Abraham with good news. Only someone overhears it and reacts in a way that God doesn't like. What does that have to do with you and me? I'm Pastor Jason Barnett, and this is the Dirt Pastor Sermon Podcast. I did indeed light my brother's hair on fire. 
If he ever, if he ever visits you, he knows this great patch of hair right here. That's why. All right, this is chapter 18, verses 9 through 15. Where is your wife Sarah, they asked him. There in the tent, Abraham answered. The Lord said, I will certainly come back to you in about a year's time, and your wife Sarah will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent behind him. Abraham and Sarah were old and getting on in years. Sarah had passed the, the age of childbearing, so she laughed to herself. After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I have the light? But the Lord asked Abraham, why does Sarah laugh, saying that I really have a baby when I'm old? Is anything impossible for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will come back to you. In about a year, she will have a son. Sarah denied it. I did not laugh, she said. Because she was afraid. But he replied, no, you did laugh. This is the word of God for the people of God. But thanks be to God. So these three visitors, they come to Abraham. They come to Abraham. And they, they, were, they, they share this good news with him. Keep in mind, in chapter 15, all the way back in chapter 12, when God first calls Abraham to leave his father and go to this land that God knew about, but Abraham did it. Part of the promise to God, from God to Abraham, was that Abraham, at some point, God was going to make him into a father of a mighty nation, right? Of not just a mighty nation, of many nations. God reaffirms that promise to Abraham in chapter 15. And here again, time still has passed, and these three visitors come and he, again to tell Abraham that God indeed has this promise for you. But they add to it, this promise you've been waiting for, Abraham... It's going to come true in a year's time. One year from now, it's going to be fulfilled. Now, when you're reading through this passage, you're going to know something very interesting about one of these visitors. In verse 10, it tells us that, at least the CSB says, the Lord said. I don't know if it says the Lord said in one of the NKJV up there. Some of the other English translations will say the one visitor. But the implication behind who this one visitor is, is that it's God. That is God speaking to Abraham. How do we know that? Because of the way he is interacting with him. For starters, whoever this visitor is, has intimate knowledge of the covenant between Abraham and God. Enough to know that this is what God's plan is and this is when it's going to happen. Two, the fact that, I mean, maybe, maybe a man in this culture would know the wife's name of his friend that he's visiting. But in this time period, this patriarchal period, it was not common practice for another man to ask about the well-being of another man's wife. This is what that important part of the conversation today. But for some reason, this sister in particular stops and asks, where is, your, where is Sarah? He doesn't say, where is your wife? But he says, where is your wife Sarah? So he calls her by name. He knows the covenant. And then he re-emphasizes the covenant. So this visitor, one of these visitors especially is unique. And a lot of the more modern English translations declare that it's God speaking to Abraham. So this, this, this God tells Abraham in one year's time, this promise that I have given you about you having a son is going to come true. The wait is going to be over. Now it wasn't just the men in that room I mean, just the memory now we're having this conversation. Because Sarah was at the doorway. We don't know whether Abraham knew she was there. We don't know whether God, like, obviously God knows she's there. But Abraham doesn't really know it. But Sarah is in the entryway of this tent, and she overhears this conversation. Now, we can debate whether Abraham had shared with her God's promise 
or whether he just kind of kept it to himself. We don't really know. But even if he had shared it with her, let's just be honest, spouses don't always share the same beliefs and convictions. I believe the Indianapolis Colts were a fantastic football organization. The Colts does not agree with that. I agree with Nicole. <laughs> Come here, Dean. <laughs> Sports teams because we just couldn't get along. She liked the Lakers. I'm like, who likes the Lakers? The spouses don't always share the same convictions and beliefs. So even if Abraham had shared that this was God's promise to their family, it doesn't mean that Sarah believed it. And so when this visitor speaks to Abraham and says, hey, in a year's time from now, your wife is going to have a son. She overhears that and she just laughs. She thinks it's funny. And she's old. See, my Abraham is 100 years, well, he's 99 at this point. Sarah's pretty close to that. And without getting into too, too much detail, I mean, the human body goes through a natural process as it goes through life, right? Our bodies are slowly decaying. As we get older, that's why I can't run. In, I can't run five miles anymore when it's ninety-five degrees outside. I don't know why, but I can't. <laughs> I used to be able to, but I can't do it anymore. Your body changes; it gets older, and so at this point in your life, Sarah is past the age of being able to have a kid. So she laughs. And sometimes, I think I'll share this with you, sometimes when God gives us a promise, when we look, when we're in a human life, looking at our human reality, the reality of what we see around us clouds out the promise that God has given to us. It doesn't make God's promise less true, it just impacts our ability to see it. And that's what was happening with Sarah. All right, let's go on to verse 13. It says, But the Lord asked Abram, why did Sarah laugh? So again, this is kind of another clue to us that this is God. I don't think Abraham knew she was in the room. I'm not sure about the other visitors. She was hiding in the doorway, just eavesdropping on the conversation. She laughs, and it's also in the text that she laughs to herself. But the Lord hears it. And he, and he doesn't necessarily confront Sarah, he confronts Abraham first, right? He says, why did your wife laugh? Partially because they're a husband and wife and they're in this together. That's why God questions Abraham. Why did your wife laugh, Abraham? And then, this is another point where we know this is God. Because not only does God overhear the laughter, but he hears the heart and the motive behind why she laughed. Let's be honest, you and I, we can sit and talk all day, and I, I, I'm going to hope and assume that you would be a, a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, that you love God, and that your actions and your words will be, and at least attempt to reflect your love and belief in God. That's always going to be my assumption about you. I had a professor in Kentucky, Mount Bible College, that said, Holiness thinks the best of other people. And that's where I always start. But God can look at us and know exactly what we're thinking and what's going on. Not just the external, but He sees the internal, what's going on also. The Lord 
Lord hears Sarah laugh, but notice what he says going on later in verses 14 and 15. He says, Any, is anything impossible for the Lord? And God is saying this to Sarah as a way to correct her heart. Because it becomes evident to God, and it becomes evident to us as we study into verse 15, when, when, when God says, why did, she, why did Sarah laugh? And how does Sarah respond in verse 15? She says, it says, Sarah denied it because she was afraid. The question we have to ask ourselves when we read that verse 15 is, why is Sarah afraid? All she did was laugh. But 13 reveals to us why she was afraid. Verse 13 says, God says to Sarah as a way to correct her, is, is, is anything impossible for God? You're laughing at the situation, but is anything impossible for me? It's because Sarah in this moment is laughing because of unbelief in her heart. God has just given a promise to Abraham, at least given it to Abraham again. She may or may not have heard it for the first time, but this is God's promise that this was going to take place. When she hears it, rather than taking God at his word, she laughs. And that laugh is a reflection of Sarah's heart. And her heart did not believe that God could overcome the human problems in the situation. And God calls her out for it. He says, you know, he says, why didn't you laugh? And she says, I didn't do that. I didn't laugh, God. And God's like, yes, you did. She tries to deny it, she tries to cover up, she tries to sweep it under the rug. And God says, no, you did laugh. The reason why Sarah is afraid is because of unbelief. And what is unbelief? Unbelief is sin. Hebrews tells us that, that what is it? I don't know where to go. This is, why, this is why I wasn't a very good Bible wizard. Hebrews tells us that, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe in what God says he's capable of, if you don't believe in who God is, then you're not pleasing him. And what is sin? Anything is, sin is anything that falls short of the glory of God. I mean, in simple terms, to sin is to not please God. So when God, when Sarah is confronted with the fact that she said, I didn't, or when, she, when she's confronted with that, she laughed, and that laugh was out of unbelief, that's why she was afraid. Because here she was, before the holy God, her sin completely and entirely exposed. And she reacted in the most human way possible. Fear. Fear and then trying to cover it up, hoping God would it us. That's what Adam and Eve did in the, in the garden, right? They commit that first sin. What do they do? They go and hide from God. God shows up and says, hey, Adam, where are you at? We used to be, hey, you meet here every time this time of day. Where'd you go? They hid from God. Why? Because they were afraid. Because they knew they had sinned and that their sin was in the presence of a holy God. Because God is holy, that means He is just. And that sin cannot survive in His presence. Sin has to be punished. And then Scripture tells us what the punishment for sin is what? Death. The punishment for sin is death. So that's why Adam and Eve were afraid. And here's Sarah now. God's conversating with her husband. God's overheard her laugh and, and is exposed to her unbelief that she is afraid of what God's going to do to her in this moment. So she tries to cover it up. She's like me with the lighter after I lit my brother's hair on fire. I didn't do that. No, I'm out. I didn't say that. What me? Sure 
Essentially what she's doing is trying to cover up sin with more sin. Because to be before God and for Him to expose your sin to you and for you to deny that the sin is there is to continue sinning. And that's what Sarah chooses to do. First, God rebukes her laugh in verse 13. And when Sarah attempts to deny and hide her unbelief, God does not let it slide. He doesn't say, oh, that's okay, Sarah. He calls her out initially. When she denies it, he calls her out on it again. No matter how much she denied it, God heard it, and he would not let Sarah brush off the truth. Now, how does this apply to us? What does this have to do with you and me? First off, Hebrews also tells us in chapter 4, verse 13, it tells us this. It says, No creature is hidden from God, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. What the writer of Hebrews is saying to us is that our God knows everything. There isn't anything in this world that God does not know. There isn't anything that has happened, is happening, or will happen that God does not see and God doesn't know about it. And remember, when I say God knows about it, and God knows all things, that means He doesn't just know and see what's happening externally. He knows what's going on in the hearts and minds of every single person that's participating in every single thing that's happening. I'm doing good to remember what I'm doing today. Right? I can imagine being a God, having, having to have all that knowledge and sort through that entire mess. That's God. God is all-knowing. He knows everything. That means that not only does God see our sinful actions and reactions, but God also sees the intentions and motives behind why we do it. When I let Travis's hair on fire, I did my best to deny it. It happened. But Travis experienced it, the students were witnesses. I could lie about it all I wanted to. I could use the, 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 the good political phrase that allegedly that happened. All I want to. But in the end, it does not cover up the truth. The truth was seen, the truth was known. It doesn't, it, and so I can use as many words as I want. I believe me, I'm a car salesman, so I can spin anything out of anything. That's not a scratch, that's a, that's a pinstripe. No, that's not duct tape. That's that's a special feature. That doesn't change the truth. God knows it. God sees it. See, in our in our, in our minds. We get afraid when we sin and our sin is found out because we know God is just, just like Sarah did, just like Adam and Eve did. So our first natural reaction, because God is only just, my life is to go and punish, is to hide from him and try and cover it up so he doesn't see it or know about it. But the problem is that we cannot fool God at all. You can't. He just knows it. He knows what the truth is. And he knows where you stack up to the truth. And whether you're on par with what his standard is or whether you fall short, that God knows. So in fear and in our natural human response, our natural reaction, proving that we indeed have a sinful nature inside of us, as our natural response as human beings is to hide from God. So God is all-knowing. God can't be fooled. And that's typically where we stop and focus on those two things about God. And that's what makes us afraid. That's what prevents us from coming to Him. That's what tempts 
prevents us from, from being honest with Him. But the way of holiness, the standard that God has called us to and designed us for, is to humbly humble and honest before Him. You see, we, we, we do a good job in the church, and we do a good job in our, in our lives focusing on that God is holy and just, and that God has a standard, and we forget that our God wants us to worship both in spirit and in truth. And the truth of God, the love of God, is made up of both grace and truth. It's never one or the other, it's always grace and truth together. That makes up the love of God. And God loves us way too much to allow our sin to go up, to be swept under the rug, to go unnoticed. He doesn't do that. He didn't do that with Sarah. He said, Sarah, Sarah's like, I didn't laugh, God. And God's like, yes, you did. He confronted her with it. And, and he's not doing that to be mean. He's not doing it because he's excited. Oh, yeah, she's sitting now. I'm going to strike her with a lightning bolt. Or I'm going to get the giant newspaper of heaven and smack her like a spider. Barry and I had a good time just watching spiders this morning, didn't Barry? God is in that way. God confronts us in our sin because He loves us. Yes, He is full of truth. Yes, He is just. Yes, He is holy. But He confronts us in our sin because He loves us and He knows that sin separates us from Him. If He allows the sin to go unchecked, unchallenged in our hearts and in our minds, then it's just, He knows it's going to separate us from Him and it leads ultimately to death. And God loves you way too much to want that for you. So what does God do? God comes after you and says, No, you have sinned. You have sinned against me. Yes, I am holy and just. I don't allow sin to go unpunished. But guess what? I love you and I have already paid that punishment for you. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross. He was the once and for all atonement for all time's sake. The penalty of sin for all time has been paid with the blood of Jesus. This, it starts with the sin of Sarah and Adam and Eve and goes all the way through the end of time. Jesus' sacrifice was enough for everyone for all time and space. That means that not only is our God just and holy, that means our God is loving and forgiving. You see, we focus, and fear, fear has us focusing on those first two things, but God is willing to communicate you through you, through what he did with Jesus, that God loves you. God doesn't want to leave you there. All you have to do is humble yourself before him and confess what it is that your sin is. James 1.9 says, humble yourselves before God and he will exalt you. And we fear God's wrath. And we hide from him. We try and cover it up. But the shame and the guilt associated with sin in our lives drags us down into a pit. God doesn't want you in the pit. God wants you to humble yourself so he can lift you up. You are a child of the kingdom of heaven. And he wants you to live your life like it. Not be stuck in the pit of defeat. He goes on to say this. In, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if God confronts you in your sin, He's not doing it to, to, to because He wants to punish you. He's not convicting you because He hates you. He's convicting you because He loves you and He wants you to humble yourself and confess it to Him. Because in confession you find freedom. Even if your sin is unbelief. Confess it to God. It doesn't matter what you've done. 
And maybe what you did really wasn't that bad, but God, but in your heart and your mind, God knows the truth of why you did what you did. God wants you to confess that sin too. That was the entire point of the Sermon on the Mount, right? You see, we get so focused on the do's and do nots, like it's the checklist of things we shouldn't do and things that we should do. But those do's and do nots don't mean a thing if your heart and your mind aren't in the right place. God wants us to confess our sin to Him. Even our sinful attitudes, our sinful intentions, our sinful motivations. And the scripture tells us that our God is faithful and He loves us to forgive us no matter what it is. I said a little bit earlier that the type of worship that God desires from us is to worship Him in spirit and in truth. He says that to the uh, he's interacting with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. And she's, she's lamenting the fact that the Jews say that the Samaritans have to go worship at the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus says to her, there's a coming a day when God, you won't watch God on this mountain or, or in Jerusalem, you're worshiping him. The, the true worship is worshiping him in spirit and in truth. That's talking about our beings. It's talking about us. God is not interested in a religious show from us. He's not interested in us. He doesn't want us to deny our sin. He doesn't want us to cover it. What God wants more than anything is for each and every one of us to humble ourselves before Him and confess what it is that we're struggling with. It doesn't matter if, if you're not a Christian at all and you've never been saved. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian and, and you've been caught up and entangled and done some of sin in your life. It doesn't matter if you're struggling with, with mental, mental things or, or heart issues. God wants you to confess that to Him. Because it says He is faithful and just, not just to forgive your sins, but to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If there's any unbelief in us that, that's not of God and it's, and it's just pleasing to Him. But God doesn't want to punish us for that. God wants us to confess to Him so we can experience His grace and truth. No matter what the sin is, you and I can't get away with it. We can't tell God, I didn't do that. But the good news is you don't have to. Because the heart of the Father says, I'm just come home. Oh, well, just tell me all about it. And so we confess whatever it is to God, He says to us, For I will forgive your wrongdoing, and I will never again remember your sin. That's what Jesus did for us at Calvary. And when we believe in upon God, when we believe in the name of Jesus and what He did for us, when we choose to accept His forgiveness, we are met with a wave of mercy and grace. We don't have to earn it, because honestly, we can't because we'll never deserve it. But God gives it to us. listening to this episode of the Dirt Pass Sermon Podcast. It was recorded live at the Greensburg Church of the Nazarene, located at 31 Bluebird Lane in Greensburg, Kentucky. Our theme song is called The Dirt Path, performed by Jeremy Edwards. If you would like to share a word of testimony with us or what God's been doing in your life, you can reach us at P.O. Box 215, Greensburg, Kentucky, zip code 42743. Or you can also find us at www.gbergnaz.com on the Greensburg Church and Nazarene Facebook page or the Dirt Path Facebook page.